back to your seats. We love to greet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Uh, welcome, everybody. We all survived the camping trip. Um, went home and took a shower, jumped in the pool and took a shower. So I'm good to go. <laughs> Slept good last night. All right, if you need a prayer card or a tithing envelope, just raise your hands and our ushers will get that to you. And the prayer card, you just fill that out and we're gonna pray over anything that you have. We're a praying church, we believe in prayer here. You can give online um, at Breakthrough Peoria.com. You can download our app, Tithely app, um, and look for a Breakthrough Church directly to your phone. People can help you with that. Any questions you have, you can always go to the ushers. They'll direct you if you don't know who to ask. You can send uh, your tithes and offerings in the mail. Uh, 8110 West Peoria, Suite 110 Peoria, Arizona, 85345. 
Now I know that you will all remember that. So as a reminder, there's no child care uh, yet. We're hoping to start that soon. Um, there's a movie playing in back. If your child needs to uh, go back there, you can go back there with them and watch a movie. And um, again, hopefully starting that soon. Please don't use the foyer just because the noise and things it take them into that room. We uh, love children. We love to have them. It's good to see kids coming back to church. So I can't wait till children's church starts. That is our hope. <laughs> that is our hope is our children. All right, we're going to be starting a prayer, a prayer altar ministry on the 28th. I invite anyone that would like to uh, listen, just come and learn about the class. Or if you would like to be on the prayer altar ministry, we would love to have you. There'll be a sign-up sheet out in the for you. You can see myself or my husband. We'll be happy to sign you up. You can come the first time. If it's not for you, there is absolutely uh, no obligation. If you just want to come and hear what it's about and what the ministry is going to be about, we'd like to get you plugged in somewhere that uh, you can do the work of the Lord. The women's group Peace is Choice will be this Thursday at Bobby's house at 6.30 p.m. Please... Um, Get that information from Bobby. Where are you? Bobby, raise your hand there. Yeah. If you don't see her, just ask the usher. They'll get you to Bobby. That is uh, women's ministry. It's, gonna, it's, it's an awesome ministry. Uh, women need to talk to women. We need each other. So go. Enjoy. Get away from your men. <laughs> and go talk about them. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Everything is confidential. <laughs> All right. Uh, marriage enhance. I better move on. Marriage enhancement will be starting again this Friday, June 19th. It will be held here at the church at 7 p.m. And you can see James and uh, Arioli about that. And they're right back there. So, again, if you don't see them, just ask the usher. They'll direct you to them. Did I miss anything? All righty. I'm going to read Luke 21, 1 through 4, in the uh, Amplified Version. It says, looking up Jesus, he saw the rich people putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. He said, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in proportionately more than all of them, for they all put in gifts from their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. The wonderful uh, moment in this story is that Jesus noticed her. It wasn't what she gave. It's not about the giving. It's about the heart. I'm not going to tell you that you have to give all that you have. 10% goes to the house of the Lord. That's scriptural. What you give above that is between you and the Lord. But this woman knew where to go when she was desperate, broken, and in need. She knew to go to the Lord, to come to the house of the Lord. Because he says to gather even more in the last days, to gather together, to uplift each other and to help each other and to encourage one another. I want to encourage you today that he sees your need, and he has not forgotten you. Corey Tim Boom once said, you may never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Let's pray over our offering. You are our only Savior, Lord. No one else can save us. The government cannot save us. Our jobs cannot save us. Only you, Lord, can save us, bless us, and carry us through difficult situations. We look to you today, Lord. We ask you to search our hearts as we give to you because you are all we need and the only one that can truly rescue us. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor, and we give to our Lord to do the work of the Lord, to bring in the harvest. We thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
Praise the Lord. Before I start on this morning's sermon, I forgot to mention a couple of things before the, uh, when we were opening. During the pandemic, a very special thing happened in a family, and that is Mike and Brianna Munoz got married. Amen? Well, she wasn't Munoz then, but she's a Munoz now. So congratulations to you guys. And I'm not sure, did you guys notice a little something different with the worship this morning? Did you know a little something different? We want to welcome a couple of our new members to the church. Actually, there's quite a few that they have with them as well. But, uh, man, you guys sounded amazing. Wasn't it amazing this morning? It sounded great. Just when you think something can't get any better, it does. So we want to welcome Adrian and, and Lisette. I mean, I don't know if you go, Anna, Lisette? Lisette? Okay. I just say, hey, just come here. No, she's family, so I'm just. But, yeah, so welcome, you guys, and thank you so much for ushering us into the presence of God this morning. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, you can turn your Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 13. And I'm going to be going over different scriptures, but um, we just had Mother's Day in May. Obviously, next week is Father's Day, correct? If you didn't remember, next week is Father's Day. I saw, I saw a couple of shocked faces, so it's next Sunday, Father's Day. All the dads are like, yes, okay? Don't make him cook his own steaks on that day, all right? Um, so I thought it'd be fitting to do a sermon this morning on something in between, and that's parenting, Parenting 101. Yeah. Now, not only have I raised three of my own children, but in case you didn't know, me and my wife, or my wife and myself, have also raised approximately 400 young men from the prison system when we were doing prison, our uh, group home, a Christian group home. So we have a, a couple of lessons and things that we learned in the meanwhile. And so um, I'm, I'm not an authoritative figure on any of these things, on parenting by any means, but I've, I've, got, I've got children of my own and have gone through uh, them being small, obviously, to adulthood. And so still parenting, even adult children, can be a task at times, but it's also a great joy at the same time. So what I decided to do this morning was I didn't want to start off crazy, so I said, you know, i got to find something a little more watered down just to get everybody. So I went to the Message Bible. <laughs> Amen? So if you can put up the sermon for this morning, the, the scripture, a refusal to correct is a refusal to love. Love your children by disciplining them. Now, do you guys know what the New King James Bible says about that? This is the New King James Bible. I'm going to work you guys in slowly. The kids are already mad at me, but you're going to be all right. Trust me. You're going to be okay. They're like, mm, I don't like this. I don't like this guy already. Okay. So the New King James says, whoever spares the rod hates their children. But the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Okay. So kids... Don't stop listening just because we started off that way. Okay, this is for the parents as well. It's not just for you guys, okay? So I'm going to tell you a short story about a gentleman by the name of Philip Yancey. He tells about an African safari that he was on where he's seen an old mom giraffe taking care of her offspring. Shortly after he was born, she went over and kicked her offspring. We want to do that sometimes, huh? And it looked like she was really hurting her baby. Then she did it again. And each time the little giraffe would get up on his wobbly legs and try to walk. Still she continued kicking him. Finally, he got up rapidly and ran away from her kicks. Philip Yancey turned to the guide and said, why does the mother giraffe do that? The guide answered, the only defense the, the giraffe has is to the ability to get up quickly and run away from its predator. If it can't do that, it will soon die. Yancey said that while it looked like it was a cruel thing, it was really the most loving thing the mother could do for her offspring. Sometimes discipline, the disciplining of our children is the same way. It looks cruel to correct sometimes, but sometimes it's also one of the most loving things we can do, showing them right from wrong. Let's pray this morning. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus 
that you would remove me this morning. Let your Holy Spirit speak to your people, to parents and children alike this morning, Father, that each one would get something from this word this morning, Father. I pray, Father, you would have us be in a spirit of unity this morning as we get closer to you and your word, Father God. I thank you, I praise you, and I worship you. In Jesus' most precious name I pray, amen. It was Billy Graham who said this, Children will walk, talk, eat, think, and respond like their parents. You ever look at your child and say, Oh, you're just like your father. You're just like your mother, right? You see, we have to give them a target to shoot at. We have to give them a goal to work towards. We have to give them a pattern that they can see clearly. And you give them something good that gold and silver cannot buy. Discipline. Discipline. And I'll talk about discipline as I go and the differences that we're going to be speaking of a little bit later. But I want to go back to another child-rearing issue that we have a lot of desperate parents because I know uh, my wife and myself, we were very young parents. We've been together 32 years. And so when we first got together and started having kids, uh, we were very young. And I'll tell you, uh, when you're a young parent, you get desperate real quick. And you start, Mom, he cries all the time. I don't know what to do. He's always peeing. He's always doing this, and I don't know what to do. Do they ever stop, right? We get desperate. We don't know what to do. And so we start calling the people that do know what to do. But how many of you guys know that God's word will always tell you what you can do? Right. Especially when it comes to children. Amen? Dorothy Law Nolte, she's a, a, a family psychologist, a psychiatrist and counselor. She wrote down these thoughts. You can look this up too online if you want. Her name is Dorothy Law Nolte. If a child lives with criticism, he learns to condemn. If a child lives with hostility, they learn to fight. If a child lives with ridicule, they learn to be shy. If a child lives with shame, they learn to feel guilty. If a child lives with tolerance, they learn to be patient. If a child lives with encouragement, they learn confidence. If a child lives with praise, they learn to appreciate. If a child lives with fairness, they learn justice. If a child lives with security, they learn what it is to have faith. If a child lives with approval, they tend to like themselves. If a child lives with acceptance and friendship, he learns or she learns to find love in the world. If a child lives without discipline, foolishness will be their way. If a child is disciplined, they will know love. Amen? You can look that up online under her name. I'll say it again, Doroth, Dorothy Law Nolte. So sometimes it takes a little while for our children to catch on to some of these things that we're going to be speaking about today. Some of us might have adult children that are, we're still trying to help them get it. Was that just me again? <laughs> me and Johnny? We're like, okay, we got some late bloomers. Huh? Okay, I feel you, brother. All right. Sometimes we have one of those child, the children that it takes a little longer to learn these disciplines than others. Sometimes they catch it right away. You know, I remember being disciplined as a child, and, and, and it, was a, it was a harsh discipline, but I learned the first time. And then I had my brother. I hope he's not watching right now. Sorry, bro. But, um, you know, he was one that you could just, you can spank and spank and spank, and it didn't matter. It was one of those kids. You guys know what I'm talking about there, too? Hey Amen. Jessica, I know you're watching, so you were that one. Just know that. <laughs> I, I spanked her one time, and she just looked at me square in the eye and said, that didn't hurt. <laughs> you know what that can do to you, right? I think I threw my arm out that day. <laughs> no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I didn't. I didn't spank her again after that. Um, but you know, to be a parent is, is to have this privilege, this wonderful, wonderful privilege of raising a child that, that God would, uh, would um, trust us with, you know, to, to parent, to bring into the world, to, to impart his word, his spirit into, so that they could grow up doing the same, leaving a legacy. Discipline. So I'm going to give you the differences between discipline and punishment. 
okay? So that you guys understand, and this works with relationships as well, not just with children, okay? But it also works with relationships because sometimes we can uh, discipline a spouse, say, hey, you know, I didn't like when you did that, you know, don't do it again, or whatever the case may be. But sometimes we tend to punish our spouses. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Okay. <laughs> I'm glad we're all on the same page on that one. If you're confused right now, don't be. All right. Discipline means this. Discipline means the practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior. Punishment means the infliction or imposition of a penalty as retribution for an offense. So I did some synonyms online. I looked for some synonyms to punishment. And I thought, wow, this is pretty interesting here. Synonyms for punishment means to penalize, getting retribution, chastising, and look at this last one, damnation. To punish means to damn someone. It's a synonym. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23, you don't need to turn there. The Word of God says this, For these commands are a lamp. His teaching is a light, and the corrections of discipline are the way to life. Ephesians 6.4 in the NIV says this, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. The NLT Bible says this in Proverbs 22.15, A youngster's heart is filled with foolishness. Look at your child right now and say, you're full of foolishness. No, don't say that. I'm just kidding. We were all full of foolishness, aren't we? Even some of us, when we get older, we still stay foolish, right? You know, when, you know that's one thing that used to bother me quite a bit is when people would say, what's up, fool? I'm like, do you know what a fool is? A fool is a godless person. That's what fool means. So when the Bible speaks here, a youngster's heart is filled with foolishness, ungodliness. Okay? But we don't have to be young for that. There's plenty of us here that practice foolishness. Amen? And we have to be careful. Every time you talk about disciplines, there's always going to be a debate. Should I spank? Should I not spank? Should I do this or that? Timeouts. You know, there's so many different belief systems. And you know what cre- creates a big uh, gap in a, in a relationship is when you have somebody that's real soft and then you got somebody that's just gun ho right? Like, no, this is going to stop right this second, right? And it causes this, this friction to take place. Hmm? So the goal for this morning is I, I, I want to help you and not hammer you, okay? The second goal is I want to come alongside you and never try to elevate myself above you. I have children right now that love God and then there's one that may be not so much right now. Okay, so I'm going to be transparent with you this morning. I have a child that really doesn't believe God right now. Amen? And as much as it hurts, I want you to know that I'm in this fight with you. That I'm going to believe and not look with my eyes, but I'm going to see with my heart, with expectation in what God is going to do for my children. Every single one of them. Because the promises of God are yes and amen. My wife and I, we have three kids, and so we've, we've gone through probably pretty much everything a parent can go through with children. The third goal is I want to challenge you this morning, and I want you to reach your potential as a parent. Because I don't know about you, I'm still learning. Like, I had to learn how to deal with little ones, now I have to d- learn how to deal with adult children. That sometimes they anger me, get me upset, whatever the case may be but how to love them the way they need to be loved and show them the love of Christ. So whether you're a pre-parent, a single parent, a step-parent, a grandparent, and I'll tell you, these days, there's a lot of grandparents raising up children, right? Any other kind of parent that you may be as well, I want to help you by uh, helping you with the struggle that you're going through. Why do we discipline? What's the goal? It's my goal to raise the most intelligent child, athletic child, beautiful child, well-liked child. No. That's not the goal. That is not the goal at all. 
The goal of discipline is simply this, to mold and to shape our children with their unique talents and abilities to reflect the nature of God. It's to have children who mature and reflect the character of Jesus Christ himself shown in the Bible. So each of your children is very different, correct? Does anybody have kids that are exactly the same? No. Our kids are so completely different. The three of ours, you wouldn't know they're from the same parents. You know, and I'm pretty sure they are, right, babe? Yeah. <laughs> They are. We, I know. Because <laughs> each one has a little something of me, and I'm like, oh, Lord. The payback is brutal. <laughs> so write this down if you want, okay? You can write this down if you want. My goal as a parent is to mold and shape my child to reflect the nature of Jesus using God's word as my guide. Hmm? using God's word as my guide. That's it. Everything else doesn't matter from that point. They're going to they're gonna prosper in what God has gifted them to do. We might not always like the gift that they have, but we have to learn to be able to look at it and say, okay, Jesus can use this gift for something. Amen? How do I do this? How do I build a relationship? We have to first build a relationship, be an example, and share the truth. We have to be the example. In other words, it's very easy for us to put our Christian face on when we're around our Christian friends and around our Christian church, but then when we come home, we're not a very Christian parent. And it causes confusion to our children. It causes confusion to our children. We need to be Christian 24-7. Like, oh, I feel the Holy Spirit today. And then Monday comes around, and because you're, you don't get your coffee, those of you guys that are fasting this morning are, are done with the fast now. Boy, didn't that coffee taste good after 21 days? Can I have extra sugar and butter on my muffin? And, and da, da, da. <laughs> That's another thing. I tell you what, it, how many of you guys seen some breakthroughs through this fast? Oh, my goodness. We're, you know, we'll be having some testimonies about that. We need to have some testimony of people sharing. It's still blowing my mind how through the midst of a pandemic, God blessed us with more people here at the church. Amen. He, he, he blessed the worship team with more singers in, in, uh, you know, and instruments. And, and then he blessed us with a, a, a property. And I'm like, in the midst of all this, what would look to be a bleak time, God still shines. Amen. And man, he's good like that. So as parents, we're to reflect the nature and character of God to our children. We're to discipline because why? God disciplines us. But we're to reflect his love. In other words, every time I discipline my children, I'm mimicking my maker. My maker. God isn't shy to discipline us, is he? And we shouldn't be shy to discipline our children. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, in the NIV, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those whom he loves as the father, the son he delights in. Amen? It's biblical. So I want, us, I want you to notice something here today, that God doesn't punish us. Our punishment was taken on the cross 2,000 years ago. Your punishment, my punishment. He disciplines us. Discipline isn't something we do to our children. It's something we do for our children. There's a difference. You're going to hear a lot of postmodern mumbo jumbo these days that imply love is positive. It's positive and discipline is negative. Don't do it. But there's a way that we can discipline our children compellingly and lovingly with them knowing that we still love them. And it's not like if, you're, if you spank your kids and you spank them, and you, I still love you, I still love you. I remember hearing my dad say, and you'll, you know the famous saying, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> I remember the last one still, stinging. <laughs> Amen. There's no way discipline, uh, we can discipline them effectively 
if there is no love behind it. Hmm? Love and discipline are tethered together. They're bound together. Dad and mom, when you discipline, you're reflecting the nature and character of God. If God does it for us, he is the perfect parent. Then we must do it for our children. We have to do it for our children. We have to think of the potential that our children have. God has given us, who are parents, our children, and we have the opportunity to love them through discipline, not punishment or con condemnation. We have to do it strategically, prayerfully, and effectively every single time. Because, you know, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, there was a couple of times where I felt like I over-disciplined my son when I was younger. And, you know, he still remembers that to this day. I try to forget it because I knew I was wrong. Amen. I knew I was wrong. I was doing the best that I knew how to do at that time, but I understood I was wrong, and I've repented since then. But do you remember when you were over-disciplined as a child? We can remember back, way back, can't we? Why? Because it's a hurt. It was done wrong. We felt at that time it was not done in love, and it's a scar that stays. Amen? And it'll cause resentments, and we can bring those resentments and hurts from then into our Christian walk to give us this lack of trust towards God and his people. Well, I've been hurt by everybody, so this church, this pastor, these leadership, this worship team, they're going to hurt me at some point in time or other. Hmm? And we have to be careful. Sometimes other people pay for what somebody else did to us. You guys understand what I'm talking about this morning? And it's not fair. It's not fair to the person that's getting that payment. They're trying to love you, and we need to let them. Amen? You guys following me this morning? I told you it wasn't going to be as bad as you thought. How about the implementation process? How do we apply and live out discipline? First of all, there has to be clarity. Did you always know what you were getting whooped for? Because I didn't. It would just come out of nowhere sometimes. I, well, what'd I do? You know, and then I would tell my dad. I'd be like, Dad, you know, I, I didn't do it that time. He goes, oh, it was for the other times that I didn't catch you. <laughs> but we have to be clear. We have to be clear why we're disciplining our child. And it should be something that's done right away. Like if they did something a month ago and you just found out, don't start whooping on them now or disciplining them now. <laughs> Things need to be done in a timely manner. And I'm not always saying to spank, okay? That's not what I'm saying, because some of you may not like that or do that. That's you. You're parenting, and you know your child. Amen? <laughs> it gets better, trust me. Clarity. None of us would think about involving ourselves in an athletic contest without boundary lines. Now, when you get fouled in basketball... What do they do? They stop everything, and they let the other side know, you can't touch this guy now. He gets to throw a, a free basket. Sometimes two. Hmm? Because they set out some rules clearly. They're clear on what they're saying, that if you do this, you hit them, whatever the case may be, they're very clear on what the payment is for that. Right? What the discipline is for that. Oh, oh now they get a free shot. Hit him again, he'll get another one, right? Hit him again, you'll get thrown out of the game. You'll get a timeout, right? Grown men getting a timeout. You've seen it many times. They do it in sports. We should do it as parents, amen? Oh, you guys are rough this morning. I know all of you didn't go camping and are tired out right now. We shouldn't enter into the disciplinary concept and the disciplinary game unless we have clearly drawn the lines. We have to understand the concept of clarity. If you do this, this is what's going to happen. So that it's fair. So that your children know. And we do that with any relationship. We have to draw boundaries in our relationships. Hey, I don't like it when you talk like that. I don't like it when you do this. Or I don't like when you come home late at night without calling me. I don't like it when you don't answer my text. Can you just give me a text? A call? Just drawing out some boundaries is okay. We need to do them with our children. Children, you can do them with your parents. Well, I don't like it when you don't. No, I don't want to say that. Because then they'll say it. 
never mind. Because I know them because the, the kids went. <laughs> I'm not going to give you ammo, you guys. <laughs> when it comes to discipline, we, we've got to outline the playing field. Okay? Once again, when we outline the playing field, we're doing what God has done for us. He gave us his word and he gave it to us very clearly. Right? Very clearly. There's no guessing. He wrote it down. We listen to it. It tells us what will happen. The wages of sin is what? The payment of sin is? Yeah. The discipline. That's discipline. When you do this, this is what's going to happen. He drew a line. The Bible is a book that outlines the playing field. It shows us how to run, where to run, what's going to happen to us when we step out of bounds. We have to understand the concept of clarity. Some parents have listed rules for their children along with the penalties that will be applied when they step out of bounds. They're so clear on their discipline that I've even seen families post it on a fridge. You ever seen that when you walk in? You're like, oh, okay. It's like that in this house. That's not a bad thing because it's a reminder to the kids. You know, you can tell when it's really working. When the kids walk by the fridge and they see that list and they're just like. <laughs> they're like, yeah, they mean what they say. And we'll get into that too. You see, children want lines. As a kid, I never thought I wanted lines, but I'm glad. I look back and I used to, I used to laugh about how my, my dad would spank me and stuff like that and discipline me. But I think to myself, if he hadn't have drawn some kind of line, I was already a bad kid. You know, but if, if he hadn't have drawn some type of line and been consistent with it, what, what, what else could have happened to me? What more would I have done? Because I feared my father more than anybody else. And so when he drew these lines, I still was like, okay, I, I know he's just trying to make me a good person and help me. I understand that. But then, of course, you know, the sin nature and, and the pride of youth, you know, gets in the way sometimes where you go, ah, they don't, they're old, they don't know what they're thinking, right? But children do want lines. They're begging for boundaries, and we need to set the lines, we need to be clear with them. Too many of us today, do you guys remember those magna doodles? Do you guys remember what those are? It's where they put those little magnets and you draw lines and stuff like that. And then when you don't like what you've drawn or you're done with it, you just go, and it's all gone. Well, sometimes parenting is like that. And after you've drawn the lines, sometimes you made shapes. You can move the little slider and the lines are gone. A lot of parents will draw these lines that I'm talking about, these boundaries, and then they do away with them. So the child says, oh, well, I didn't get disciplined last time, so maybe I can do it again and get away with it. You see, the next point after clarity is consistency, being consistent with your children. Now, we can be consistently good, godly parents now too, correct? Parents, that was a good time to say yes, amen in front of your child, <laughs> right? That's a real good time to say amen in front of your children. We need to be consistently godly parents to our children. Okay? So, I'm going to give you a hypothetical situation here. Referees enforce rules. That's what they do. As we know, football is a great game to watch. Hypothetically, let's say Rudy Johnson is running towards the goal with the ball. He's going to score. Right before he cuts into the cross the goal line, an opposing player reaches out his hand and grabs him by the mask, jerks his head and throws his head down to the ground. Johnson is out, laid out on the turf. He, he's trying to figure out, they're trying to figure out if his neck is broken. The fans are booing, they're going crazy. And let's just say in this hypothetical game that the referee runs over to the opposing player who has grabbed Rudy and made him fall and says, son, did you grab his mask on purpose? What if the opposing player said, no, it was an accident. Don't the kids always say, it was an accident, right? And what if the referee goes and says, well, don't do it again. 
I want you to go apologize to him and give him a hug right now and just behave for the rest of the game. Do you think that's going to happen in football? So you see several player, uh, plays later, Carson Palmer comes in getting pounded by one of the defensive players. He has him on the ground and keeps banging his helmet and throwing his arm and say, Carson is laid out. He's in pain. The referee runs up to what's going on. And the ref looks at the player while he's pounding him in the head. And he says, look, you're going to be in trouble. I told you that if you did this, you are not going to be able to go to Chuck E. Cheese tonight. If you don't stop hitting him, don't make me count to three. A lot of times, this is how we discipline in our homes. We say we're going to count to three, and we go up to 30, and we still ain't done nothing. You guys know what I'm talking about? And you know, them kids will catch on to that real quick. They're very little, aren't they, when they become little sinners? <laughs> they know how to play mom and dad against each other. They learn that from a little age, right? So we got to turn them little sinners into little, well, little Christians. Amen? Knowing the fear of the Lord and discipline. It's not always easy to be clear. It's not always easy to be consistent. Because sometimes, if you're like me, I was a parent that I try to be consistent, but I forget what, I was, what rule I made, you know? So they'd get away with it every once in a while, and I'd have to re-go over my parenting skills, obviously. Why do we have to be consistent? Because our children are begging for it. Our children are begging for it. Mom, dad, step-parent, single parent, when we're consistent, let me show you what happens. Consistency leads to reliability. Do you know those people that you can always rely on because when you call them, they're there? Do you? Do you know the people who are not? You know them too, don't you? You know them as that, unreliable, inconsistent, inconsistent. Our kids can say, if we're reliable and we're consistent, I can count on my mom and dad when I mess up. There's going to be a consequence. Hmm? I saw this video. It was a funny video, and it was funny to me. It might not have been funny to other people, but it was funny to me. In all the things that were going on over the last few weeks, and there's riots going on, and there's this mom that goes over there, and she gets her kid. She grabs him by the arm. She says, you ain't going out like this. You get over here right now. This grown kid, he's like six foot. She grabs him. I said, that's a good mama right there. She'll go into danger for her child to show him that's not the way. This is the way. In the midst of chaos, this mama says, I'm going to go get my baby out of there. And I'm going to show him, no, not this. Let me show you a different way. You see, that's what mamas and dads do when we're consistent, when we're reliable. They'll say, if I do this, I don't want to do that because I already know. I already know. And you know what? They'll take that into their, into their adulthood. And then not only will they take that into their adulthood, do you know why you're a strict parent? Some of you guys that are, how many of you guys are strict parents? A lot of us are strict parents because, be, <laughs> a lot of us are strict parents because our parents were strict to us. We didn't turn out so bad. Do you know why? Another reason why a lot of us are strict parents? Because our parents were too lax with us. And we're like, no, I did all kinds of stuff. And I don't want my kids to be doing what I did. So there's two different reasons as to why. But the goal is, is to be consistent and to be reliable. Amen? You guys following me? From infraction to infraction, from parent to parent, stay consistent. Reliability gives our children confidence. It gives them self-esteem that if I need something, I know my parent will be there. If I do something wrong, I know there's going to be a price to pay. I would rather discipline my child than a corrections officer, than a judge. Because that's my job. That's what the job God gave me to do. Not someone else. Not a school. Not a program. Me. My wife. 
You see, that's something that money can't buy. That's something that a trust fund can't touch. It's something that an Ivy League education can't put a finger on. If we're consistent, like the hypothetical, hypothetical game I described, that's what happens. When children see their parents as unreliable, then the child is insecure. The child is tentative. Maybe, maybe not. They misbehave. They try to control their own world. And everything suddenly becomes up for grabs. If I want something, I'll just take it. Because there was never a consequence at home. We have to be consistent. When you're clear about the expectations and then consistently enforce what you expect from your children, they learn to obey and follow directions. When they go to school, you know, I remember I had a, a, a good friend. His name was Mark Tafoya. This guy had no, I mean, his father always talked down to him. He was my best friend. His father talked down to him. His mother talked down to him. And he did everything he could to get their attention negatively. Negatively. And I said, how come you don't listen to your dad? He says, he doesn't listen to me whether I'm good or bad. So I might as well just be bad. There was never a line drawn. He knows what I'm talking about because he's met him. He's ended up at the facility he worked at, which is a psychological facility, correct? It messed him up that bad, not having a line drawn for him as a child. Hmm? And you know, the sad part is, is I used to get him out of trouble since we were five years old. And you know, when he was with Robert at CBI, who did he want to talk to? He wanted to talk to me. And I'm not saying that boastfully. What I'm saying is, he's still a five-year-old. That's what I'm saying. If you know who I'm talking about, he'll tell you. He's still five. He stayed stuck. He never grew because nobody ever helped him to grow. No boundaries, no growth. Understanding parents this morning? It's unfortunate that his name later became Dizzy. And the reason for that is because he didn't know if he's coming or going. No direction. No future. Reliability will give our children uh, confidence and self-esteem. When you're clear about expectations and then consistently enforce them, Expect your children to learn and obey from them, from your direction. You must understand that a Jesus, that, that what you are at home, and I've said this before, what you are at home as parents, grandparents, and the like, step-parents, is this. You are Jesus with skin. Simply put, you're Jesus with skin. If you are loving, they will understand the loving God. If you are clear, they will understand God's word is clear. If you are consistent, they will understand God is consistent. Lastly, unity. We must be present. When it comes to discipline, we have to have a unified front. Mom and dad, you need to work together. If you're a single parent, well, you know, you, you need to do what you need to do. Call upon people of the church to help you out. That's okay. Mother and father, you are on the same team. Here's how a lot of discipline plays out. The mom oftentimes is on the front lines of discipline, and she is sort of seen as the heavy hand, the moms. Then sometimes the father is seen kind of like the cruise director. Oh, everything's so good, so cool. Let's just all be friends, right? Let's say a daughter asks her mother something, and the mother says no, especially if it's a daughter. And you go to mom first, and mom says no, what's she going to do? I'm going to go ask my dad, right? I'm going to go ask daddy. Huh? It's amazing to see how they learn to play one parent against the other parent at a very young age. Let's say the, mom, the daughter runs from mom to dad and asks the same question. You know what we need to say in that sense? Did you ask your mom? Well, yeah. Well, what did she say? Well, she said no. Okay, well, then it's no. But then what takes place after that is if you two don't agree, don't disagree in front of the child. 
Get, that's a win for them. That's a victory right there for them. You don't want to give those little rascals victory. Amen. <laughs> We're on a battlefield here to keep our children saved. Amen. To have them serve the mighty God that we serve. And we have to be on the same team. We have to be on the same forefront. Don't argue in front of the kids. They will latch on to that, and it'll be like this at home at all times. Hmm? How do I know? Pastor, how do you know? Because I've been there. You know, one day we decided to blow the kid's mind. We said, you know what? Let's switch roles. You be bad cop, I'll be good cop. Yeah, let's give it a shot. The kids were blown away. They're like, wait, what, what's going on here? What's going on? You always say yes. Not today. Go ask your dad. Now. But you always. <laughs> you ought to see the way they walk out of the room. They're like, you know, they don't know what hit them. Right? But we can't disagree in front of them. We have to show them that it's a unified front. We have to show them that we're both on the same page according to what God wants, what God says in his word. When you show unity, it points your child to a God who is clear, a God who is consistent, a God who is unified. So I'm going to share with you the significant seven. Are you ready? You can write them down if you want. The significant seven. I'm not going to preach on each one of them. That will make for a long message. I'm going to just say them real quickly. The significant seven. Start now. You may have failed yesterday, even this morning. Start now. It's never too late. If you have breath, and I hope you do, and it's not bad <laughs> this morning, then there's still an opportunity to minister to your child. But you got to start now. Discipline for motivation, not humiliation. Okay? We want our kids to make it. I want my children to be more prosperous, to be more godly, to be more everything than me. That is the goal, to leave a legacy behind that, you know, I tell you, one of my greatest goals in life was to be a hero like my dad, a war hero. And then I didn't get sent out. I didn't get picked or whatever it was, hurt my back that it wouldn't let me go. So I thought, well, that's never going to happen now. And you know what my dad told me one day in his... In his um, He said, you are a hero to many, son, because you're leading them to the cross. Yeah. My dad. <laughs> he said, your battle is different than my battle. But you're doing what I did, nonetheless. And that blew me away, because I never even thought in that way, you know, because I know it's not me that does anything. But he says, no, but God chose you as the vessel, you know. And that broke me that day. I'll never forget that day. So we're to discipline for motivation, not humiliation. Number three, when you give in, no one will win. When you're not consistent, nobody wins. Amen? Number four, give proper pay when they disobey. The discipline must match the crime. So we don't make, we keep the little things little and the big things big. If you listen to those, that concept right there, that has been monumental to me and my wife, even with our relationship. You know, I used to, I used to get so, so upset. You know how, girls, ladies, you know how you get upset when the toilet seat is left up? <laughs> is that an amen or no? I, I didn't know. Well, I don't know, as a guy, uh, I, I hated when the toilet paper thing wasn't on the little roller thing when it's just sitting on top. You know what I mean? It's just sitting there, you know? And I would make a big old stink about it. Why, what's so hard? What's the big deal? But, you know, I learned now, I'll just put it on there. You keep the little things little, because it's little. You look at the things that go on in life, we have to learn to keep the little things little. Because we can blow up something that's very tiny, and for what is it really worth? 
the fight? Is it really worth the time being upset at one another? Is it really worth it in the spectrum of things that are bigger and going on in our worlds? Right? Is it really worth getting upset over something small? Because something small can really turn into something big if you allow it to. Give proper pay when they disobey. The discipline must match the crime. Number five, call it tight and you'll do them right. If you're going to err, err on the side of being strict and not loose. Now, I'm not saying to be militaristic or anything like that. What I'm saying is it's easier to loosen the reins than to give rope. Because when we give them too much rope, many times they hang themselves. I mean that figuratively, like, you know, in a mess. They get themselves in a mess or in a pickle. It's easier to tighten the reins. A lot of parents I see are just too loose because discipline takes work. If you are a parent that just lets your kids do whatever and there's no recourse for what they've done, then I can almost bank your child has gotten themselves in a little bit of trouble. Hmm? Call it tight, you'll do them right. Six, be specific. Think of your role as a referee in a sporting match. Every player knows the rules and the guidelines. Make sure your children understand the guidelines and the penalties. Amen? Now, obviously, if they do something wrong, you're not going to spank your 18-year-old child. You know, you're going to be spanking up here. Some of us got some big old kids, right? Bigger than us. Mine's 6'2". You know, I'd be, he'd probably look at me like, what are you doing down there? You know? Yeah, he'd just laugh at me now, I think, you know. But it has to be, uh, we have to be specific. They need to know the guidelines and the penalties. This last one is one, oh my gosh, I used to do this. I'm so guilty of this. Don't bribe them. <laughs> oh, you guys too? Good. I'm glad I'm not the only messed up parent up here. Don't bribe them. I have tried that. Trust me, it doesn't work. It's good to give incentive, but when you bribe them flat out, it's not good. Amen? So just for a moment here as we close, think with me for just a, a moment here about Jesus. He was clear. The Bible says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus was consistent. He said, Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Clear. Consistent. He was unified. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God sent his son Jesus to bring us back to him in unity, to bring back what was separated in the beginning. If you would stand with me this morning. Normally what I do in something like this is have people come and pray with their children. And I'm going to do something just a little differently. If you have your child next to you right now, it doesn't matter if they're young or old, then do one thing with me here today. Can you just look at them right now? Just tell them as a parent, I've done wrong. Forgive me if I have not done what you needed. I will pray. I will read my word and make things right. I promise you. Children, if you're here today, I want you to understand something. That as a parent, as parents, we make, we make a lot of mistakes. We do a lot of things wrong that we wish we could right from the past. And we know that you remember certain times when we were wrong. But I want to encourage you children this morning to give your parents a chance to make things right. So if I could, can I ask the children to come up here first? If you're here today, the children to come up. And the reason why I ask the children to come up, don't be shy, you guys. I'm not going to embarrass you, I promise. I'm not here to do that. I want you as children to understand 
we are going to try and do as a church the best to raise you, to love you, to help you along, to make sure that you make it in life, to make sure that God, that you know God loves you the way you are. He made you perfect in every way, in every way. And I want you to understand how important you are this morning. You are the future of the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You, it's, it's going to be up to you. When we're all gone here, us as older people, the ministry will be left to you. So if we're getting some things wrong as parents, then communicate with us. Let us know. But I want to pray over you right now, if that's okay. Father, I come before you in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Holy Spirit, touch them here today. Let your word guide and lead the way you need to. Holy Spirit, I pray that you rest upon them this morning. That you hear their prayers because it matters to you what they have to say. That they're important to you, Father. I pray in the name of Jesus, Father God, the anointing of God. Break every yoke of bondage. The sins of past, Father, of our fathers, of our mothers would not go into our generation, into this time. The bondages will be broken in the name of Jesus. Spirit of the living God, I pray over them right now. Your mercy, your grace, your goodness. I pray in the name of Jesus that they would forgive us as parents when we've done wrong, when we've been inconsistent, when we haven't shown God-like character. I pray in the name of Jesus Master, this morning, Holy Spirit, have your way. Teach us, guide us as parents to do what is right in your eyes, oh God. So Holy Spirit, have your way upon each one of them. Bless them, anoint them, separate them. Allow them to see the holiness of you, oh God. Move on their behalf, I pray this morning, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, sometimes we do wrong, and you discipline us as parents so I ask Father God that you show these children Father this morning that we love them and we want what's best for them parents if your children are up here come come and put hands on your children and pray over them come and let them know come and let them know hallelujah if you're a prayer warrior here today come and pray over these children as well if you're a leader here today come and pray over our children pray protection over them pray guidance over them this morning in the mighty name of Jesus Holy Spirit we need you desperately we need you desperately this morning forgive us of our sins this morning that we've committed against our children oh God help us Father in the name of Jesus let us do what's right in your eyes, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah.
I feel the rays of your love. I feel the winds of your spirit. But now the heartbeat of heaven, let us hear. Bondages are broken. Bondages are broken. When we live out what Jesus Christ has taught us as parents, then our children will be free. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand clap as we close this morning in song. God bless you this morning.